oftentimes whenever there's an effort to do something about climate change, the the overwhelming narrative is that it's not what workers want. It's going to hurt workers. Mm -hmm. uh, but you make a different case. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah. Um, y you know, it's it's actually not that complicated. Like if you look at the sectors of the economy that we need to dramatically restructure and transform, it's basically energy, um, agriculture and food, electricity, um, you know, transportation. These are all things that touch workers' lives and workers struggle to pay for in almost every um, regard. And you know, um, there's all sorts of statistics in even a rich country like the United States where people are really struggling to pay for, you know, rent and uh, utility bills and um, housing is another one we need to restructure. So if we start framing uh, climate policy around decarbonizing those sectors, but also delivering them in more um, cheaper or even free decommodified ways, then you know, obviously you would expect a strapped and um, indebted working class to respond favorably to that kind of program. But typically the, 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 the narrative on often the environmental uh, left is that, you know, uh, these changes we're gonna have to confront for um, environmental progress involve things costing more and that it's gonna be austerity, it's gonna be uh, belt tightening and this kind of stuff. And obviously most working class people have been belt tightening for decades and, and, and struggling in this in like gilded age economy. So that's obviously not going to um, create much uh, popularity or, or mass response for that kind of approach. For, for most of my life for now several decades, um, <laughs> the, the challenge has uh, have seemingly been um, to convince people that climate change was real, that there was this sector of people that were climate right. denialists that didn't believe it, that then they watched Inconvenient Truth or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that you had to educate people. And once they started believing it, um, they'd be confronted with the scale of the problem and 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 they would react accordingly. They would they would mobilize accordingly. But I think that that has shifted dramatically in, in, in just the last few years, uh, really. I don't really know what, what changed, what dynamic changed, but now it feels like everyone just kind of accepts the, the, the climate science, that there's very few, uh, there, there's not as many climate denialists as there, as there were in the past, uh, but the mobilization uh, did not happen. Um, can you can you talk about that? Because um, even even the right wing now kind of more or less accepts the premise of uh, of of climate change. They're just like, yeah, we're not going to do the things that you want to do about it. We're just going to like you know not let immigrants in or something. <laughs> yeah, no, um, it's true. Like even the fossil fuel industry now is admitting it's happening, and we need to do something about it. They're even pledging to reach what they call net zero emissions by 2050, which is comfortably long enough away that it, they can just make these pledges. But it's actually, um, there's still some pretty disturbing polling when you look at uh, the larger population in the United States. Um, last I looked, something like, I think nationally, 43% deny that humans are causing um, uh, climate change, which that's not the same as saying it's not happening because almost anyone can, can tell. <laughs> you just look out the window that things are not going well. But they, the forty-three percent say that it's not human caused, right? And you hear this a lot when you talk to people about it. They're like, "Well, you know, I, I think it's sort of a natural cycle, or whatever." Um, another really important poll uh, uh, found that I think if I'm, I'm sort of going off memory here, but I think it's something like fifty-seven percent of Americans don't think climate change will affect them personally. Um, so there's a real disconnect. I think you're right that there's been this, I would call it like very professional class political narrative that the key to it, it like uh, in, in igniting action on climate change is to get people to understand the truth, to believe the science, to get them to like understand all the, the complexities of the greenhouse effect. And that has really failed. You know, um, it, this is not really necessarily a politics that's about struggle over truth and belief, it's more a struggle over, uh, you know, a material struggle, a class struggle over who controls the production of energy. And to build the kind of mass support for, for policies 
uh, to confront that kind of power, it, we can't just make it about science and truth and knowledge. We have to, again, create a program that would appeal to people, even if we don't have to explain to them what 350 means, which if you remember in the 2010s, there was a whole social movement called 350 that you know made the whole goal of the social movement this very complex scientific target that we want to reach 350 parts per million in the atmosphere. And, um, you know, that's, it, it takes a while to explain what parts per million <laughs> means. And so if, if when you have 50, even 57% of people that don't even think this climate change thing is going to affect them, you have to appeal to them in their more everyday material reality, which is like I was saying before, it's a struggle to pay for rent. It's a struggle to pay utilities. Uh, it's a struggle to afford the basics of life. So if you recall um, a few years ago, when the uh, the yellow vest or uh, yellow vest movement in France sort of erupted against Macron's climate policy, which was this really regressive mm -hmm. carbon tax, um, one of the things that one of their slogans was, uh, you know, politicians care about the end of the world, but we just care about the end of the month. Um, mm -hmm. And the more the more radical people would say would have slogans that's like end of the month or end of the world, same struggle, which is kind of cooler to kind of connect those two. But the point is, a lot of that working class revolt against climate policy was that how are you uh, imposing these carbon taxes on the working class when we can barely make it to the end of the month uh, to pay for you know the basic necessities of life? Yeah, I, I think that the. Um focus on personal responsibility has been pretty devastating in um, actually doing anything that progresses uh, climate action. Uh, you know, all this nonsense about, oh, just stop using plastic bags, stop using uh, plastic straws, as if that's where the heart of the climate crisis is, when in reality, uh, as we know, there are these massive multinational corporations uh, and fossil fuel companies uh, that need to be taken to task, which I want to get to in a second. But before we get to that discussion, you know, there's a part of the left that believes in this notion of degrowth uh, to mm -hmm. respond to the climate crisis, and you push back against that. Can you explain what degrowth is and why it is you disagree with that tactic? So um, degrowth is, is you know, a, a kind of academic framework that, um, and a policy recommendation that sort of really thinks the problem with our society is the obsession with growth and particularly GDP growth. And so they kind of negate that focus by really saying that what we really need is a kind of degrowth and a planned reduction of, they often say, material throughput and, and consumption. Um, and, you know, people like myself have uh, pushed back on, again, in, in the context of um, neoliberal capitalism where so many people are struggling uh, with austerity and struggling to pay for the basics is it makes sense to put a whole policy platform around you know d growth which means less which and they often one of their slogans is we need to learn to live better with less and to really focus on this politics of less um is not uh is not gonna again resonate beyond the largely academic professional class, people who I would argue have enough and feel like they have too much and want to kind of live a more virtuous, low carbon lifestyle. Um, and, you know, um, when you push back on this, they, they often say, well, actually, we don't, we understand there's poverty and we understand there's a lot of people that need more, right? So they will say, what we really mean is that it's the rich countries in the global north that need to consume less and need to reduce their consumption. And it's the global north um, that really needs to degrow. Um, and as I say in the piece, it's just it's just the class struggle is not really between global north and global south. Uh, you know, it's between the capitalist class and the global working class and the, the working class in the global north is does not need to reduce their consumption there again. Um, struggling with decades of austerity, wage stagnation, debt, and all these things. And, and we need to differentiate yet, yeah, you know, sure, I would say the capitalist class in the global north, uh, you know, the small minority of, of wealthy people who have benefited from 
neoliberal policies over the last several decades. Yeah, they need to degrow. We need to tax them more. We need to take more of their wealth, invest it in public goods. But for the vast majority of people in a country like the United States that has this barbaric level of extreme poverty and inequality, no, we don't need to ask uh, those people in the global north to consume less. And that's not, and it's just not a winning uh, platform beyond the, again, professional class sort of academic and scientist who who do typically live these kind of middle class con consumption based lifestyles and think and can see that they're 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 kind of uh, too much and that they think that those types of middle class lifestyles need to scale down. We we talked a lot about uh, uh, on this show and the, the, the left more broadly that um, any progress on anything really can only uh, be achieved through uh, labor power and and labor unions. And then some people point out that, well, you know, a lot of the labor unions oppose uh, some, you know, climate policies, things that, you know, they, they oppose the, the canceling of the Keystone XL pipeline and things like that. Um, can you talk about that, the, the relationship between uh, labor and, and, and climate and whether that's changing or, or, or anything about it? Yeah, so this is something Anna brought up at the beginning, and we sort of always have this narrative that it's like jobs versus the environment and the workers are against environmental policy. And I think there, there are good reasons for that, because again, in this very precarious neoliberal capitalism where there's just the welfare state's been eviscerated, and if workers do lose their job laying pipelines or working in coal mines, it's not like there's a robust safety net for them. <laughs> so when they're given the choice of keeping their job or protecting, there was a famous struggle over uh, the spotted owl in the Pacific Northwest uh, and whether or not we should stop logging in that area to protect this endangered species. And yeah, workers are gonna say, no, we'd like to keep our jobs and our livelihoods. Um, but th there's no, um, you know, like one-to-one -one relationship between the labor union movement and um, environmentalism. In fact, in the 60s and 70s, one of the most famous environmentalists at the time was labor union leader Tony Mizaki, who was a, uh, at a time vice president of the Oil, Chemical and Atomic Workers Union, who really understood that his workers in the union were being poisoned by the chemical industry that they worked in. And so he mobilized the the infrastructure of those unions to push for um, what eventually became uh, the Occupational Health and Safety Administration, OSHA. And, and it really, he had he used the power of unions and um, as mass organizations to really push that law through Congress and build a more environmentally safe um, chemical industry, not only for wa water and air and spotted owls, but also the workers that work in, in those industries. Um, so, but over the last, I'd say couple, three decades, it's almost as like the environmental movement just um, ignores uh, the union movement. And, you know, famously, even the AFL CIO came out against the, you know, Green New Deal as it was rolled out by AOC and other leftist think tanks. And, and, and one of their biggest, um, complaints was that no one really asked them <laughs> about the Green New Deal and, and tried to get them involved in the construction of the policies around what, what were imagined as the Green New Deal. But we found that, um, that basically organizing initiatives that do bring unions into the, the room at the beginning um, uh, actually and get buy-in from those unions and the workers and their members in those unions can actually come together and, and build really um, labor-centric policy visions. So um, in uh, Maine, they were able to work with unions directly in the construction of this kind of state-based Green New Deal policy. And uh, they were able to pass that, that legislation with the unions fully behind them and 100% backing them. And unions still, you know, we talk about union decline and it's serious and problematic, but unions still have tremendous power. They're some of the still the most powerful institutions left on the left. Um, another good example is something called Climate Jobs New York, 
that really, again, um, sort of built from the ground up a policy framework with unions at the table, constructed, um, you know, uh, policies that were meant towards decarbonizing energy and all this kind of stuff, but wanted to put unions um, uh, in the driver's seat in terms of getting the contracts and 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 being part of the jobs that are created in this new kind of energy transition. So it's really, uh, it's not sort of inevitable that unions will be hostile to environmental politics. It's, um, it, it just, it's been that, that oftentimes they're just sort of ignored or sidestepped in, in um, what gets called environmental politics over the last couple of decades. If you enjoyed this video from Jacobin Weekends, please hit like and subscribe. That way you'll enjoy all of our backlog as well as all of our future content, including interviews, live streams, and clips. Thank you.